Michael G. Norris. <laughs> Assemblywoman Kathy Nolan. <laughs> and Council Member Jimmy Van Bray. Before we jump into the event, um, I'd like to just ask for us to take a moment of silence. Over the weekend, um, we lost a valued and storied community member, Don McCallion. Um, Don probably served in nearly every civic organization in this area. He was the president of the United Forties. Uh, the chamber honored him um, in 2013 as Sunny Center of the Year. He went out of his way to help everyone and anyone, and so if we could just take a moment in silence um, for him, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. So I'm going to ask my co-host, Michael, to come up and just say a few words about how we got the topics for today and what those topics are. Greetings. Um, <laughs> my name is Michael Coach, and um, I'm part of a uh, organization that I started with a few of your neighbors uh, called Stand Up Sunnyside. And we, uh, we worked on Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's campaign, and we tried to get some of our neighbors to try to get the uh, Sunnyside more actively involved than it was before. And we have one of my partners who's here, uh, Carlos, uh, standing in front. And uh, I just want to talk about the top topics. Uh, we thought it would be a great idea, uh, seeing how like a lot of uh, townhouses are done, uh, people are worried about how the questions are framed or how if it's influenced, if it's being steered one way or another. And we were trying to find a, a way that was much more fair and distributed from the community, and um, what we came up with, along with Melissa, uh, was something called the top topics of the community, where we would, um, on one side, we would um, have an online survey uh, via Google form, and uh, that people can write for a couple of days. Uh, we uh, were able to announce it on the Sunnyside Post, and people would put their top three top topics and maybe say something about it um, and, uh, and, and kind of generally identify who they are, like, you know, um, not their names or anything like that. Uh, the Google form requires you to put email, but we didn't share that information with panelists. And, um, and then at the same time, um, I was interviewing people at the three plazas, as the Google form, um, at the two plazas at 40th and 46th Street as the Google form was going, and to try to write down their top topics and transcribe it. And then during the day, I was interviewing businesses on the north side and the south side to get their top topics of concern, which um, at the end of it, Melissa and I combined our information to numerically uh, decide the top topics on each category, which one rises up to the top three that our candidates, uh, um, that our panelists, representatives, were kind enough to take a chance on this very experimental town hall. Um, and, and, and they're very forward thinking for doing this. It's very exposed a little bit, but they're very forward thinking uh, to participate in that so we can get a kind of better understanding of each other on the issues. And I got the results. Um, and also, uh, we shared the data and all the um, information that we got, I transcribed. So um, our representatives were able to read it. Everybody's still anonymous, but they have a general idea of the areas. And uh, we also shared it with um, Alexandria, uh, our Congresswoman, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who was interested, but we couldn't match schedules, and you know she has a lot going on. But we have um, Daniel Bonthias from her office is here today. Uh, uh, to relay, and Alexandra has this information, so she's she's looped in all this, and very interested. And um, I understand. Yeah, so I also just like to recognize that Councilmember Donovan Richards is here in our audience. So let me. Uh, what we did was we tab tabulated uh, 
I went by the Google Forms, like what the, the general categories were, um, and then we matched it up with the information from the interviews, and we basically um, got it to the numbers, and the top topics rose to the top. So I'm just gonna let you know what the top topics were for this community. Uh, topic number one equals, uh, was lack of police presence crime. It's sort of the same subject. Topic number two is homeless and the shelters, homeless shelters. And topic number three, transit, uh, MTA seven train buses. And then we, um, you know, the chamber's involved. So we have a business topic. And there was a lot of topics um, that they wanted to talk about. Um, and what we did is we, we grouped it under difficulties of doing business. Uh, things like retail rent, parking, ticketing, bike lanes, foot traffic, property taxes, empty lots and storefronts. So they can kind of, uh, you know, things that are just making it hard for businesses in Sunnyside, uh, the representatives can talk about. Uh, and, 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 and they all looked at these topics over the weekend. Uh, they were given the information, the backup data on Friday. So. section first and each representative will have about two minutes to respond to each of the topics. Then we're going to move on to a QA and a um, section and if when you came in you should have received a, a ticket that's got a number on it. We're going to call the tickets for people to come up and ask a question and Michael and I will be running back and forth in the audience because we have only one microphone. So bear with us on that please. Um, so just general guidelines, when you get up to speak, please ask a question um, rather than give a speech. Uh, <laughs> and so we want to be able to have a conversation here, right, amongst the neighbors. Um, I know that we can sometimes feel very passionate or frustrated about things that happen in the neighborhood, and we just ask that we speak to each other in the spirit of peace. <coughs> that we're respectful and we are converse and that we can hear what each other has to say about our concerns. Um, we are going to do a two minute limit for time. So if you are going over your limit in your interaction, we're going to kindly ask you the microphone back so we can move on to the next person. And um, again, just if we can keep a, a, a neighborly atmosphere and be respectful of each other, that would be really great. Thank you. And then I am going to now introduce um, our moderator, Professor David Eisenbach. David is a professor of the small business advocate. Um, as you all read in the comments, uh, there is a concern about crime. Um, we hear that crime is at record lows, yet people in this community feel less safe. And why do you think that's the case, and, and what can you specifically do about that? Uh, we'll start with the center. Yeah. I don't know if I'm supposed to stand up or I'm like, okay. <laughs> Let everyone see me in the back. Um, good afternoon, first of all. Thank you for uh, coming out on a Sunday afternoon to spend some time with us. Uh, the question was about crime. I don't, I'm not used to speaking for only two minutes. I don't think any of us are, so we'll try and keep it moving and brief. Uh, but I do want to say uh, it is sad that, uh, that Don McCallum passed, um, and uh, so we all mourn his loss. But since we're talking about crime, I also want to ask for just a moment of silence, because the, the time is running on me, for the officer that was uh, killed in the Bronx over the weekend as well. Um, so let's just take a brief moment to acknowledge that. Thank you. Um, so the issue was presented properly. Crime, by all the data we see, is actually not going up in this community, but any crime is too much crime, and there's been a couple of high-profile incidents. Uh, we are all, I'm sure, you're gonna hear this from uh, Kathy and Jenny as well, in touch with the 108th on a regular basis, and I think Captain Gibbs has been there a little over six months at this point. Um, and by all accounts, the 108th is doing their job uh, as best as can be. We are always anxious to see more police in more locations throughout the community. Uh, obviously, they have limited resources, and we try and get them what they need to do their jobs uh, as best they can. 
but they are also stretched. It's a big swath of land, the 108 covers, and so I'm sure that they use their analytics to get to the parts of the neighborhood where crime is particularly spiking at a particular moment. That's the whole Constat thing that's been a success for uh, the last couple of decades in New York. Um, I would like to see a cop on every corner that is a member of the community and is part of uh, patrolling and part of what we do here, um, but obviously that's not feasible. Um, so we're gonna try and keep the statistics moving in the right direction, keep this a safe community, and where we do see particular problems, uh, we wanna see the presence increase. Sometimes it's on the subway, by the way, where we need, um, uh, whether it's inside the subway or at the stations, and I know the MTA is a separate issue entirely we're going to be discussing, but um, that is also an area that's been of great interest to me, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit further about that when we get to the uh, MTA portion. So thank you. Perfect. All right. Thank you. Hello, happy to be here and be with everyone and talk a little bit about what we feel are the ways to tackle these problems, which is about partnership. Um, when we have a close working relationship with our precinct, it helps resolve problems. One of the things we want to do here is have a closer working relationship with everyone in this room. We spend a lot of our time as elected officials when people call with a complaint about the police or they call with a complaint about uh, something that happened in the community that they're fearful about. We try to follow up on every one of them. So the first thing I would say to people here, I know our community board chair is here, uh, Denise Ke Keenan-Smith, they all serve without pay. They come here every month for a meeting. Um, Diane Ballack, who works on my staff, who's such a wonderful asset to us, is the president of the 108 Precinct Council and spends a great deal of her time on that. You know, I would encourage everyone here to follow up so that if you see something that makes you afraid or you see something that you think is wrong, this is an opportunity today to, to tackle it. Um, I, I just want to say a, a little bit. We have tried in Albany with the election of a Democratic State Senate so that my colleague here is finally in the majority after so many years of struggling. Uh, to change some of the criminal laws so that we can have more of a approach to uh, rehabilitate, to have re-entries that work well so that we don't have recidivism. Uh, many people in Sunnyside have been involved in supporting Sister Tisa Fitzgerald and the Our Children program, which has had such success for women uh, coming out of prison so that there is not, uh, there is confidentiality, there is safety, people who are in domestic abuse situations and things like that. Um, our colleague, um, Arabella Simotis, who works so closely with Mike in Astoria, my, our next door district, has been very involved in modernizing and updating the rape laws and the laws that are about sexual assault. So it's always a comprehensive process. What can we do to make our community safer on the ground? And then what we do in Albany, how does that actually connect? We put more money into things like the burn program. Many of you may remember, we had a young police officer out in Jamaica many, many years ago, there's some here that are my age, who was killed guarding a witness. And uh, there was a very big program since then to try to enhance and reach at-risk youth. Our wonderful Sunnyside Community Services has those kinds of programs so that we don't have gang violence, we don't have uh, youthful uh, you know, violence that spirals into something else. So I'm interested in hearing what everyone here has to say about safety. I read some of the comments, but it's always important to hear what you have to say. I just want to assure people we try to, we try to make it a multi-pronged approach. In other words, listen to everyone here. Take it into consideration. How can we fix it? Do we need something different in Albany? How does the state reinforce what the city is doing and the city budget? Try to come up with laws that respond to people's concerns so that we can have a, a, fa a safe and fair city. Um, it's very scary when something happens to you. I understand that. Having just a year or two ago had a very unpleasant incident myself, someone coming, following me, and just thinking about it, I get very upset about it. But I did file a police report. Many people would not have because it was just like a verbal, uh, stupid remarks about my, I don't want to get into it, but it was a, it was a had a sexual, it was very unpleasant, all right? But the person just followed me for two blocks and then I yelled out and the postal person, the letter carrier was coming down the block so there was somebody else and he, he kind of ran away. But I insisted on filing the police report as best I could. Many women would not have in our community. They would have said, well, what was it really? But no, you have to because then the police have the data they have the data that someone was harassing someone. They have that, so no, nothing is too small to be reported. And I would urge people to always do that because it is terrifying, really, it changes your view of things. But you have to keep up 
in our very great city and understand things can happen anywhere, of course, but we have to work hand in glove with our police department. We have to support the community groups that work with the police department. We have to try to support each other as colleagues so that Albany is not distant from City Hall and that we can work together and try to respond in a way that's um, helpful to everyone. And of course, we also have to support trying to divert people, especially our young people, from getting in with the wrong uh, places and the wrong crowd and, and then you know, looking at, at crime. So we try to do it on many, many levels here. I'm proud of that. I'm proud of the money that we bring to groups like Sunnyside. And I would urge everyone here, we'll be here all day, come to us with your problems and we will follow up on them. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. I too just want to say uh, Don McCallion was an amazing man and uh, did so much for so many people, uh, including serving on the 108th Precinct Community Council. I, I want to say uh, to your question, which is why if the precinct is reporting very low crime numbers for the 108th Precinct, do we have uh, at least some people reporting persistently feeling uh, that crime is higher than they are saying and feeling unsafe. And I would just say that if you have been the victim of a crime in any way, shape, or form, you obviously are going to feel this very personally and not feel safe. If one person is victimized in our community, that's one person too many. Uh, so I met with Captain Gibbs a couple of weeks ago. We all meet with him regularly uh, and talk to him. He assured me that the staffing levels at the precinct are actually at the highest that they have been. Uh, in many, many years, and so they have the full complement at the 108th Precinct. Um, he also said, though, and I think this is something that many of us know, there is a, uh, a shameful persistence of certain kinds of crimes uh, that we're seeing in the 108th Precinct. Uh, domestic violence, uh, sexual assault. Uh, these are some of the crimes that uh, Captain Gibbs uh, spoke to me about that uh, is of concern to Captain Gibbs and should be of concern to all of us, of course. So Sunnyside is a great neighborhood. Uh, uh, Woodside is an equally great neighborhood. Uh, they are safe, they are successful. Uh, these are strong neighborhoods uh, with good schools, uh, good parks, good libraries, and so many wonderful people living and working here. Uh, if we have one, Violent crime, it's one violent too many, and obviously we have more to work to do, but I know at the council we have uh, put a lot of resources into making sure that our communities are safe, uh, while also pursuing uh, restorative justice and making sure that we are looking at criminal justice issues uh, in a progressive way, uh, looking at reform, and not simply looking uh, to lock people up in cages. The, the next major issue uh, deals with homelessness, and this connects in with the issue of crime. Uh, I read through all the comments, and what came up repeatedly was particularly women feeling less safe because they were harassed on the streets by people who they saw was, as homeless people. Um, what is your sense of what the city, what the state can do on the issue of homelessness? They acknowledge that we need to take care of the homelessness. They are part of our community, but at the same time, there is a sense of less security. We're gonna rotate this one. We're rotating. Um, first, I would say I, I, we have to continue to be a compassionate society, obviously, that tries to help people. We have to address the housing issues in our city, which have really skyrocketed in course. And I think in this last legislative session, again, with finally having a Democratic Senate, we were able to do that. So many people here may have been involved in the issues around rent control and rent stabilization. We obviously put a package together that really strengthened tenants' rights and tenants' ability to stay in their apartments. So um, we need to do more. Obviously, in many ways, the affordable housing issue is uh, frustrating. There's an area mean income that uh, makes it unaffordable for many people. So there's these complicated formulas that come from the federal government. We need to address that so that the answer isn't just the developer goes up five more stories or 15 more stories so that you can pay $1,900 for a studio under the area mean income. Um, so it's definitely something that I believe Albany will continue to focus on in this coming year um, and try to have some answers to. Now, on the issue of the homeless shelters, it is very problematic and very difficult to cite them, especially when the city continues to have very, very large 
shelters. So, for example, in Dutch Kills, we've had a continuing problem. We, will, we tried to work with the group, it's women, but any time we go to an advisory board meeting, they'll say things like, how many 911 calls in a month? And they'll, they'll say 600. And I'm like, no, not the precinct, the, the, the address. And they'll say, no, that is for the address. So that can't be the answer. These groups get big money to run shelters, and they have to be able to work with the people there so that we're not calling 911 and throwing it to the EMS you know, uh, every two minutes or to the police department every two minutes. So it is a problem, and to pretend that it's not is, is to pretend. And so we don't do that here. We try to be realistic. We're trying to work to get these things smaller. At this point, our community has done its fair share. We have a number of hotels that house people who are working. Um, we need to do more in the mental health field. I mean, the issues go on and on. So whatever we can do locally, if there are concerns about uh, you know, people kind of gathering and if they're in inebriated or under the influence of drugs, we want to handle it in a, in a multi-approach multi way, uh, not just in the police way, but in a way that perhaps delivers mental health services and other things. But it is problematical, it's not easy, it certainly hasn't been easy in the Dutch Kills community to work with that program, and it's been a frustration for us with the providers who are getting a lot of money to run these things and don't always run them well. So um, the city uh, does, we did put a lot of money in the budget, and I'm sure Jimmy will speak to that, but I, I have with me a lot of data about what the assembly advanced in its budget for human services, and um, some of them include uh, things that I've worked on as education chair, like after school and things like that, but that's not really about the homeless, so we'll wait for that for later. But we do spend hundreds of millions of dollars in our city and state, and we need to get a better return, and we need to provide more help for people so that, yes, everyone can feel safe, and also that, that people can stay in their own homes. That would be the best way and prevent homelessness that then leads to other problems. So uh, the homelessness crisis in the city uh, is a multi-pronged crisis, right? It is an affordability crisis. It is a mental health crisis. Uh, it is from any uh, substance abuse crisis uh, that drives people uh, out of secure housing uh, and onto the streets and or seeking permanent shelter. I want to reiterate what the assemblywoman said, which is that uh, in a compassionate humane society, uh, we should treat those uh, less fortunate than us with compassion and with humanity. Uh, and homeless individuals uh, are human beings, first and foremost. Um, that does not mean that Mayor de Blasio's uh, sightings of shelters is uh, fair or equitable or that the process works. I'm not saying that, but what I am saying is that we have to think about this as an affordability crisis, a mental health crisis, a substance abuse crisis. Uh, the folks that we see in shelter, uh, uh, by and large, uh, are people who have hit rock bottom uh, and who are desperately searching uh, for a way to get off the streets and into a place where they and their children can survive. That is the nature of what we are dealing with. The folks that we see on the streets uh, are in many ways even worse off. And, and I know that we see homeless individuals living on the streets in our community sometimes, right? A lot of people know him as a change man, right? The uh, man who often asks for change outside of Dunkin' Donuts or on Queens Boulevard in front of our office. He has a name. We know his name because my office has tried to help him dozens and dozens of times. Uh, my staff is here, Deborah Tharrington, the director of our constituent services operation. We try, and we will continue to try, to help Mr. Davis off the streets of Sunnyside and into permanent shelter, into the treatment that he desperately needs, because I don't believe that the life I see him living on Queens Boulevard is a life that we would want any human being to live. So we're trying to both get those folks who are homeless on the street suffering with those real human issues, uh, the help that they need. And then when it comes to shelters, uh, we certainly have to do better. Uh, and uh, Blissville in particular uh, uh, saw an unfair uh, a burden placed upon it. But all of us have an obligation uh, to make sure that we're part of the solution 
of homelessness. Uh, all of us have an obligation to treat people humanely. And if you go into the shelters, as I have, and speak to the young women who predominantly live in most of them, with their young children, they will tell you that I've escaped a domestic violence situation, right? That we were in a basement, but the mold was going to kill my children. And I needed a place to go. We need, as a society, to make sure that we are actually reaching out and providing a hand up to those folks, not demonizing or vilifying them. I'll just say also that the council, the state, certainly has done some really great work in terms of making sure that people can continue to live and afford their apartments. Uh, the council, a few years ago, put in the funding to make sure that every person who's attempting to be evicted, because we have an eviction crisis as well, uh, has a lawyer representing them. That uh, They have the ability to fight against uh, landlords who are trying to evict them. All of that uh, is part of what we're dealing with. All of that to say that uh, we've done uh, some good work. We have a lot to do. But first and foremost, we have to see homeless individuals as human beings and as people who also are a part of our community. So what you're hearing up here, I think, is that the homelessness problem is really an intersectional problem. It involves mental health issues. It involves substance abuse. It involves domestic violence. Um, I can't get into all that in the two minutes, but first and foremost, I think it involves housing affordability. That's probably the one thing that is most directly impactful on the homelessness crisis that we have. Um, you heard uh, the Assemblywoman and, and Jimmy both mention this. We have done incredible work this year with the new majorities in, in the Senate and our partners in the Assembly to tackle one prong of, of that the problem, which is keeping people in their homes who were getting evicted at an incredibly uh, awful rate. Uh, when the rent laws were not really protecting tenants, but were providing landlords with a way, an easier way to get people out of their homes. <laughs> we have a lot of activists here I've worked with, Nilda Rivera sitting right up here in front from Cosmopolitan Apartments who are dealing with the problem that uh, is ongoing uh, on this issue. But we now have the strongest tenant protections uh, we have ever had in New York uh, because of the work we did just this past year. Harder to evict people, harder to, to use some of these loopholes to raise rents. The, the financing model for a lot of developers was to actually purchase a home and value it based on how many people they could evict in a certain number of years. So when they were getting their loans, the amount of loan they would get, the amount of return they were expecting was actually based on how many people can we kick out of their homes in the next five years because we could raise the rents and make that much more money. So we put a big, uh, uh, we slapped that process from, from happening the way it was. The next big part of the problem is actually creating more affordable units. So you've got to keep people in the homes that they are, but then also create affordability because gentrification is surging in our communities probably more than anywhere else in the city right now. Uh, and we've got to figure out a way to put a stop to it. The luxury developments are just going up everywhere. Rents are going up everywhere and people are getting priced out. Uh, we, the city's done some good work to try and build what they call affordable units, but how they define affordability comes down to be the problem. So, so yes, if someone come, wants to come and they insist on, is it 30% now, Jimmy? It's somewhere in that ballpark, depending. They insist on a certain percentage of a, of a new development being affordable. Then the question becomes, how do you define affordability? Uh, Brian Barnwell and I, um, and I know Kathy's been supportive, have, have been trying to figure out how to solve that puzzle. A couple years back, we came up with the idea, don't base the affordability metric on the region, because that's what they usually do because that includes Manhattan, it includes Westchester and Long Island, and creates a measurement that's way too high. The problem we have now is we are actually very expensive. So if we base it on our own zip codes, we are pricing ourselves higher. So we've got to figure out a new way to try and solve the problem. Uh, but the housing issue, both keeping people in their homes and creating new units for regular people to live in, uh, will go a long way towards solving it. I will also say that the shelter system uh, in the city is broken. The way they site these places is broken. The people who run them, as Kathy said, uh, are often not doing what they need to do. They don't tell the community uh, um, as they need to when they're coming, where they're coming, or why they're coming. Oftentimes, I've seen situations where we have had better ideas of where to put a shelter. So we wouldn't even be saying no. We just say put it over here where it would be less disruptive to everyone, including the residents of the shelter and the city just pushes ahead and does what it wants anyway. So 
we also have to solve that siting problem uh, in terms of the shelters. I, I should have, I just, I know we're, we're uh, keeping it to a timetable, but I should have mentioned, as Mike just did, that we have a bill to have a community advisory board for every shelter. For over 35 years, we've had a shelter on Borden Avenue that had very little uh, community problems because we had an advisory board. Unfortunately, the city has moved away from that, and it's not the right approach. Community advisory boards are like the, um, you know, the canary. They find out if things are being run well. They let, they give the uh, organizations that run these shelters feedback. Obviously, it's a big time commitment to ask people, but many of our local business people in the past have done it. And I think whether it's Blissville, Dutch Kills, the ones on Queens Boulevard, all of them, if there was a community advisory board commitment on the part of the city and these nonprofits, would help solve some of these problems because then you'd be in a position to say, I see a man on 46th Street, what can we do to help? So we're gonna keep pushing that bill. We have Senate sponsorship. We're gonna keep moving forward. Thank you. The uh, skyrocketing rents have not only increased uh, the amount of displacement and homelessness in New York City, but they're also affecting small business. Uh, we have high rent blight in New York City, and all you have to do is walk down Queens Boulevard to see it. Um, there are two bills. One is in front of the City Council called the Small Business Job Survival Act, and Danny O'Donnell just introduced a piece of legislation uh, that does a similar thing uh, in the State Assembly, uh, which would, number one, guarantee a 10-year lease renewal to all small businesses in good standing. Number two, if the landlord and tenant can, cannot come to an agreement, they go to an arbitrator, legally binding arbitration. And three, there are no pass-alongs. The rent is the rent, all right? So there's no pass-alongs. You're not gonna wind up getting a bill for $30,000 in back taxes from your landlord uh, that he's passing along to the state. Uh, do you support this legislation in each of your uh, chambers? And, uh, and do you think that that is a good solution? There? Is there anything else? Uh, before I answer that, I just want to uh, piggyback on what the Assemblywoman said. I agree about the Community Advisory Board's uh, legislation. The problem, of course, is that uh, the city and the Department of Homeless Services uh, calls many of these shelters temporary shelters, and, and that's the problem. Permanent shelters do have Community right, Advisory right, Boards, right, right, but right. if they deem it to be temporary, right. then all of the rules that normally apply to a homeless shelter uh, don't suddenly apply, right. and, the, yeah, and, and the Assemblywoman is, is correcting that, but uh, that's a terrific piece of legislation. Yes, I support uh, uh, the Small Business Job Survival Act, and I'm a, a co-sponsor uh, of that legislation. Uh, it is something that has been uh, kicking around for a while. Uh, 33 years. Frustratingly uh, uh, slow, uh, and uh, Council Member Idanis Rodriguez is the co-sponsor, the lead sponsor of that bill, and uh, uh, I would hope that we would be able to uh, get the political will in the city council with Speaker Johnson uh, leading the way to actually get it done. Uh, I want it to happen. Uh, it needs uh, uh, that political will and that push from that leadership element. Uh, there is a, a, a radical motion to discharge uh, which could actually propel a piece of legislation forward and force it uh, to the floor, even against the leadership's will, I am willing to sign that motion to discharge to make sure that bill happens. Can you explain that just a little bit more? What we would have to do in order to make that happen? Well, uh, as I think everyone understands, the Speaker of the City Council is a very powerful uh, person who has a, a, a lot of uh, sway on what bills actually get voted on, essentially. So this bill has uh, been heard, been introduced, been heard, uh, but clearly it is uh, uh, not progressing as quickly as we want it to. It is almost never done. It is the nuclear option, if you will, at the city council. Uh, but if uh, uh, seven uh, council members are willing to sign a motion to discharge, uh, you can actually force it uh, to a vote. Uh, that can and should happen. Uh, I, I have not had a chance to see Assemblyman O'Donnell's okay. bill yet. Um, I think that was put in after the session concluded, uh, but I'm happy to look at it, and if, assuming it is what I believe it to be, I'm happy to be supportive. I, I'm aware of the city proposal that's been around for I think you and I have discussed that uh, directly in the past. Um, the small businesses in our community are suffering from the, the business version of what we call income inequality for regular people, right? So the big players, the big box stores, the big businesses are able to come in 
and get their own deals and they can afford to do what they're doing and too often the mom and pops are getting squeezed and squeezed and squeezed uh, and it is time that we establish some special protections for them because they are the lifeblood of a lot of these communities. They're the lifeblood of Sunnyside uh, and Woodside um, and so I'm anxious to support any proposal that would move us in that direction. I would, I would want to read it first. I, I'm not, I haven't seen it, and I don't know, you know, I, I wouldn't be prepared to say at this moment. Obviously, we want to do things to help our small businesses. It might be better to do some kind of a tax break program than a, than a real estate program. I really don't know. So it's definitely something we'll work with the chamber and follow up. And Assemblyman O'Donnell is the criminal justice guy in the legislature and the guy I go to on most of those issues. So I'll definitely take a look at it. Thank you. Uh, the next topic, topic is the MTA. Um, what's wrong with the MTA and what are you going to do? Uh, I get to go first? Okay. Oh. Is it, you, did you just start the last one? I think it was an addendum to the first oh, okay. question. Um, I, I do want to add one other thing on the Small Business Job Survival Act, which is uh, uh, I assume that most of the people here are uh, members of this district, but if you look at the list of city council members and you see a city council member who is not a co-sponsor of the Small Business Job Survival Act, you should call and write them and ask them why they aren't supporting small businesses in the city of New York. It's not enough just to show up. Uh, you've actually got to be on this legislation and pushing it. Uh, the MTA, uh, one of this community's favorite all-time topics. Um, as everybody knows, uh, I ride the 7 train uh, all the time, uh, and I know that it has been uh, the source of incredible frustration for so many people in this community. Um, many of you, uh, like me, um, are fed up with the MTA, uh, the structure of the MTA, and the unaccountability, uh, the lack of accountability of the MTA. Uh, I am also a huge supporter of municipal control of the MTA because part of my problem as a council member is that the MTA is of course a, a state authority. The governor appoints uh, the leadership of the MTA. Uh, the governor really controls uh, the MTA. Um, and when we, the city of New York, uh, have unacceptable delays, unacceptable situations like we do with the seven and other trains and bus lines, uh, who, who are they accountable to? How can we put the pressure on them to actually respond in meaningful ways? Uh, I will say that Andy Byford uh, is uh, probably the best person that we've seen in, in, in my time. And I want to thank Access Queens, and obviously Melissa's been active on this issue for a long time. Uh, what we have done, obviously, is use the bully pulpit of the office uh, to raise awareness and put pressure on the MTA. It works, it has worked. With all of the debris falling down all over Roosevelt Avenue, 61st Street, 52nd Street, uh, 63rd Street, uh, they wouldn't have done anything if we didn't go out there and point out every single time something nearly killed someone. And at first the MTA said, there's no problem here, uh, nothing to see, everyone keep going. Uh, and then something else would fall, and something else would fall, and something else would fall. And then finally, uh, uh, Andy Byford changed his mind and agreed to put up some protective netting. It is only up in a few blocks. Uh, the problem is much more systemic, but we have to make sure that we're doing all we can to make the MTA accountable to the people who actually live in these communities who pay the fare uh, and who deserve much, much better service. So uh, I'm proud of the work that we've done uh, and will continue to do to make sure that the MDA is held accountable. But I will say this, if we had municipal control, uh, if we took it away from the governor uh, and the mayor, whoever the mayor happens to be in the city of New York, had control to appoint the president of the MTA, just like they do the school's chancellor, I believe you would have more accountability uh, because the mayor of the city of New York would then listen, I believe, much more to the concerns of strap hangers and those who ride the buses in the city of New York. Uh, I, I wonder how many people here feel that 
Seven train service has gotten better since they installed uh, the communications-based train control. Any of you? A couple, a couple of folks, right? Uh, uh, but that took 10 years, um, uh, uh, billions of dollars um, uh, for what I think, at, this, at least in this room, uh, appears to be moderate uh, improvements in service. Uh, we've got to do better. Uh, we've got to make sure they're accountable. Right now, the MTA, the board structure, how it works, who appoints, uh, is deeply problematic and doesn't work for us in the city of New York. Put the city in control, I think you'd have better results. Who's next? No. Okay, the MTA is pretty much the bane of all of our existences up here, I think, and we've been dealing with them for a while. Fundamentally, they have two big problems. They don't have the resources they need to invest to make it a world-class system or keep it one. Uh, and then when they have money, they don't spend it wisely. Uh, and so there's two prongs. Because we can't just keep throwing money at them without making sure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing with the money. For example, I represent Sunnyside, Woodside, Long Island City, but also Astoria. And in Astoria, we went through the period that's actually still ongoing during the last few months of it, where they would shut down a station entirely for six eight to eight months. And we would say to them, great, you're shutting down a station. Are you doing anything to improve accessibility or service? You're cl closing down the station. We put a damn elevator in the station, which we've been begging them to do uh, for years and years. And of course, they wouldn't do it. It was mostly cosmetic improvements. They spent hundreds of millions of dollars on it. And it was a total waste of money that the MTA doesn't even really have. The good news is we made so much noise about it, they were planning on doing this in a lot of places in the city, and they terminated that program halfway through, so we saved a lot of other people the same uh, dilemmas that we had uh, on the Astoria line, the NNW. Uh, but nonetheless, we have stations that look really pretty, so you can enjoy your time waiting for the trains that never come, uh, <laughs> when you're saying on the subway, uh, which is just how they were thinking. We did manage to get Astoria Boulevard, which is the last one that's closed now, is getting elevators, thankfully. Um, and so that should be happening in the next few months. Um, and then in the capital plan that was just approved, uh, Broadway, uh, both the Broadway on the uh, NW line and the Steinway Street Broadway stop uh, is also slated to get uh, some elevators, but we need to do more and in more places. We have the worst accessibility of any major mass transit system in the country. Only 23% or so of our stations are accessible, and that's not just for uh, people in wheelchairs. These are uh, new parents with strollers or senior citizens or people just carrying things to and from a uh, shopping trip. I mean, this is just uh, abysmal that we have such a low rate, by far the worst in the country uh, in terms of the accessibility of our stations and then the service. We all know the problems uh, with that. Uh, Jimmy mentioned the seven line. Part of the problem is we have a dramatic infrastructure problem in Western Queens because the population is surging so quickly. Uh, we can't keep up. So when they started that signal line changing thing a decade ago, it was probably a good idea and would have improved things a lot more if it was in place a decade ago. But by the time they got it done, the population's already exceeded and the demand has already exceeded the benefit that um, is being provided from that change. So we have a lot of work to do. We did some good work uh, in Albany again this year as part of the budget. We got 15 billion new dollars, but also insisted on uh, an independent audit of how they spend the money so we can try and tighten the reins on how the MTA does what it does. Uh, and I do agree uh, with what Jimmy said about Andy Byford. And the team there now is a team that most people have confidence in that they're trying to do the right thing. Hopefully, they'll be allowed to do their work and, and get the job done. Thank you. Obviously, you know, uh, concur with some of the things that were said. Uh, just quickly on a couple of things that I've been more directly involved with. First of all, early in my career, we passed a bill to allow the public to speak at MTA meetings. That still exists, and again, I would continue to urge people who want to be activists to follow the meetings, uh, put your two cents in, make sure the board members hear what you have to say. It's worked very well, and for many years, we were the only system in the country that didn't do that. Um, the same thing with some of these capital projects. Again, many years ago, we were able to get funding for the viaduct, but it did not resolve the problems past 46th uh, Street into the 50s. We had the biggest problem with the 
uh, collapsed um, material has been, uh, in part because they were doing a major job there. It's, it's, it's definitely a, a big focus of all of us in the legislature. We voted for congestion pricing in this last legislative session, and I can tell you that many, many people in our community have written me very angry letters saying that they did not support congestion pricing because they feel it limits their ability to get into Manhattan. And for a long time, I was very, very torn because I do think that's a concern, and in, certainly in London and other cities, it has become an issue. But in the end, you know, we have a lot of people here that are very transit oriented, and I felt it would provide sustainable funding to the MTA. But it was frustrating to have them say they want another 50 billion or whatever it is, even though they, the, the thing isn't even up and running yet. So it has to be observed, it has to be focused, it has to be something that spends a lot of our time. For a, a while in my career earlier, before I worked on education and labor issues, I was the assembly's representative to the Capital Review Board. One of the things that happened after 9-11, many projects like the Signal Project were pushed aside we were involved with a $600 million project to harden the seven train tunnel because the city realized that they had to relook at every subway tunnel in the, in the state, really, in the city rather, and then other projects in the rest of the state in the uh, downstate region. So, uh, you know, it's constantly evolving. The capital plan constantly evolves. I don't, I don't do that anymore right now. Uh, we have a different member on it, um, but Speaker Hasty is very involved with it and they share information with us. So it's not something that it, you know, gets fixed overnight. It's an ongoing process. Unfortunately, for a long time, I felt the last two capital plans were not representative of the community's needs and were really about borrowing, short-term borrowing. But that's a complicated topic for maybe a longer meeting at another time. But I would continue to ask people to get back to us. Bus lanes are another controversy. You know, people want them because they want bus accessibility, and then when they go in, everybody hates them. So it's, it's a big issue, right? We get a lot of fleet feedback from small business against it, but we're trying to see if we can you know, come up with compromises, maybe limit the hours, et cetera. One of the reasons we don't have the accessibility we should is we have Accessoride in a bus system. But I agree with Senator Gennaris. We've worked very hard to try to get more accessible stations. And it's very frustrating for me personally. Many of you know I have an artificial hip. I had a birth defect. The stairs are not always easy for me. And I think about someone who is really has a mobility issue. You know, I can do it. I just sometimes am sort of grumpy about it, you know. But you know, not, but, you know somebody who really can't do it. Um, and again, we've had forums on Accessoride and other things. We have a lot of complaints about Accessoride. I don't know if anybody here has ever used it, but my office, we get a lot of complaints about that. So how do we fix that as part of the accessibility piece? But um, it's an ongoing topic, an ongoing process. Sunnyside is so dependent on the seven train. It's such an important line. I can only tell you that millions have been spent to harden the tunnel, to do things that have made the ride safer, but then some of the other projects got shunted and finally are happening. So, um, you know, just keep the feedback coming and we can continue to keep the pressure on. We have to go to more uh, buses that are less polluting. Uh, it's a big effort now. I know, do you still drive an electric car? Mike drove an electric, you, didn't you drive an electric car for a while, hybrid? I mean, we're all trying to come up with um, new ways to drive. I thought you did. Um, to, to, you know, I, I, I mean, the trip to Albany is tough enough. We haven't been able to come up with a car that gets us there by battery. But, you know, I would just say to people, keep talking to us so we know uh, what the issues are. We're out there, obviously. We feel we see it. We drive it. We use it. We take the system. We're on the subways. Um, you know, keep talking to us so we know what to focus on. Uh, last topic before we move on to the Q&A. This year, uh, there's going to be big discussions and planning over a project that's going to shape the future of Queens for generations, and that is Sunnyside Yards. My nightmare scenario is that it becomes another Hudson Yards, a preserve of the 1%, a big mall completely disconnected from the neighborhood, six times the size in the heart of Queens. What are some of the lessons that you've learned from what we've seen out of Sunnyside Yards and um, Hudson Yards, and what do you plan on doing to make sure that we avoid that? Now I get to go first. Um, <laughs> all right, um, I mentioned just a moment ago we have an infrastructure problem in, uh, in this part of Queens. I can't imagine something dumber than proceeding with a massive project like that without considering the <laughs> infrastructure concerns of the neighborhood. 
if you're going to do something like that without thinking about open space, mass transit, schools, uh, hospitals, et cetera, it would be a grave mistake and, and something we already talked about, like affordability of housing. It would be a, a grave mistake for our community. It would be a grave mistake for the whole city. So I am not looking to have Hudson Yards dropped in the middle of, of our community. I don't know if anybody else is, but I certainly am not. Um, and there's this process that's been ongoing. Um, and I don't even know what EDC is doing, but they've kind of thrown all our names on this list, even though many of us have not agreed to be on it. And so we get, keep getting questions about these community advisory groups that I've not sat on, but I somehow I'm on the letterhead of the EDC because I think they just listed everybody who represents the area. Uh, but I have not felt really good about the process that's, that they've been using either in terms of getting the community involved and hearing the community in terms of what we want to have happen here. Because I'll tell you one thing, and we've all got experience with this in a number of uh, projects, I am not going to let a top-down uh, proposal land on our community without us having something to say about it uh, and making sure that we're protected. Yes. I, am, I don't know if we brought it with us, but some of you, it's on our website. Um, it's got to be almost three years now. We, I published an editorial in the Daily News saying that I would oppose the Sunnyside Yards project as Deputy Mayor Glenn, Alicia Glenn at that time, and, and really it's, it's been a bit of thing, you know, they're not listening to us. You know, th this is the problem that Mike just articulated. We've, art we've put in why we don't want it. We've put in what we think is unacceptable. We've talked, I mean, I at one point had said to people from the city, you know, <laughs> you're gonna give us a walkway park. Like, what are you talking about? You know, you wanna build us a brand new LaGuardia Community College in a, in a beautiful park setting? Then let's talk, but that's not what they're talking about. And they're not responding. You know, EDC continues to have these meetings. I am sorry that the meetings have been disrupted. I understand a lot of young people today want to kind of feel that that's how they express themselves, but I, I don't feel that disrupting them is going to get us any answers. Part of the problem here is it's been top down because it can be. Amtrak is in its own negotiation, which is a federal issue. Amtrak is federally run. If Amtrak continues to pursue letting the city's Economic Development Corporation put this together, we're going to have a big problem. So there are things that are out of our control that we have to work as a community to focus on. Remember, no one needs more money than Amtrak. So if they think they can get a return here that's worth their while, even though I don't understand it because the platform is like 700, how much is the platform? 700 million. Mil I get the millions and the billions confused, you know? It seems almost, uh, it seems untenable to me, completely untenable. But you know, again, we don't know. We're not in total control here. So right now, we, we're, we've said no to all of it. We've said no to all of it. But, you know, and the op-ed is out there, and we keep resetting it to the mayor, and we send it to, now there's a different deputy mayor, and we resent it. But I am anxious about it. I, I feel that it would change our neighborhood. I mean, it just, it's incomprehensible. Having said that, I also don't support a stadium there. There's still efforts. You know, a lot of people have said, there's a little underground thing that goes on where people say, well, okay, uh, we'll never use it for housing, but what about a convention center or a stadium? I don't, never wanted that either and opposed that many years ago. And then the last issue there is do we put a station there? That's the one thing that I've always tried to be a little open to if we could have access to the Long Island Railroad at Sunnyside Yard so that we here did not have to go into Manhattan and there could be a stop there for Amtrak and the Sunnyside Yards. And that is moving forward, my friends, because that, is, again, is 9-11 related. There was a, re a recognition that if something happened at Penn Station, would there be redundancy? So I think, you know, those trains from Boston all come through the yards, those Amtrak trains. The other crazy things there, New Jersey Transit washes all its cars there. I don't know how many people know that. That has to be dealt with. It should never have been allowed. But see, again, I wrote, I have a file of letters against that because I've been around in this job a long time. Guess what? Amtrak didn't listen, okay? They really weren't interested in what we had to say as a local community board and state group and small business group, all right? They did what they wanted. So it's a problem for us. We're gonna need a lot of oversight over Amtrak to really stop this thing from becoming a nightmare. I do think, though, issues like the station have some thought, some potential, but then you hear that accompanying that would be housing around it that we don't need. We need housing, but we don't need more high rise. So it's going to be a very contentious thing. Um, we're on the record in opposition. My, my op-ed is out there, and if you can look it up, or we'll send it to you if you want. But I think that we have to, it's not enough to just say we're opposed. 
because I think, that, and it's not enough to just frankly have young people come and disrupt the meeting. I think we need to come up with some real effective ways to put pressure and find out what Amtrak is thinking. And that's something we're gonna need our congressional delegation to help us with and our borough president, and yes, our mayor and city council and the state assembly and the governor, because if Amtrak keeps these conversations going, that's a problem. We need Amtrak to at some point say, you know what, it's not feasible, you know, we, we, we're not gonna do it. But it's, it's out there and I think it's still something that's pretty concerning for all of us. Uh, like my colleagues, I do not support EDC's plan for Sunnyside Yard. It is not, it is not what any of us want, I believe, as the future of our community and Western Queens. Uh, you started with a discussion of Hudson Yards. Hudson Yards is an atrocity, uh, an absolute atrocity uh, that uh, is not only ugly, um, even the public art is ugly. Um, <laughs> It uh, is an absolute disaster, and I refuse to go to Hudson Yards or go on that vessel thing uh, because it's a billionaire who uh, supports Donald Trump's vision of what New York City should be. This is what New York City should be. Uh, these neighborhoods, Sunnyside, Woodside, Astoria. So uh, I don't support it. We've told EDC that. Uh, we've, we've certainly expressed our concerns a million times. Uh, as the Assemblywoman said, uh, because of the multiple uh, uh, lots that are owned by multiple different uh, uh, people, uh, it, is, it is sort of a hybrid of a city, state, federal uh, issue. Uh, but uh, I believe that all of us working together uh, can and will stop uh, this bad plan from ever taking place. I think it is way too uh, cost prohibitive for them to even entertain uh, decking over uh, the yards. Uh, and what uh, they need in order to be able to afford that or make that uh, a promising proposition for anyone is unacceptable to me and unacceptable to, I think, the vast majority of people in this community. It cannot happen, it will not happen. A few years ago, some folks talked about uh, Sunnyside Yard uh, and the BQX, uh, two really bad ideas uh, coming from this administration and neither of which is ever gonna see the light of day. I'm, I'm glad Jimmy brought that up just to add something quickly because both the BQX and Sunnyside Yards are things that are so far off into the future that we are going to have a chance to express ourselves politically on them in the 2021 municipal elections. There will be another mayor long before those plans get off the ground and so we will have a chance to have someone who may have a different view than this administration does on both of those projects. All right, so uh, we're going to start the, the Q&A. Um, so I'm just to reiterate, uh, I'm going to read off the, the numbers. Just raise your hand uh, if you're a lucky number. Uh, five, seven, one. All right. And just again, uh, just keep your questions as questions, not as statements, and keep it to you know, a reasonable time. Hi, um, my name is Danielle. Um, I'm a lead organizer for Empire State Indivisible. I live in Dutch Kills, so thank you for having me here. Um, I actually um, want to ask about, we've talked about a lot of issues we're facing, homelessness, housing affordability, transit, and there's many other things, including the climate crisis and mass incarceration. And I'm wondering um, if we could, if this is a state question, um, if you would consider how we plan for this and financially, and if you would consider um, a tax on the super wealthy to pay for some of the things we need to um, proceed with, and challenging the governor's um, uh, cap on the budget. Yeah, we, we, yeah, we, we've, a lot of us in the assembly have voted for things like that for a long time. You know, there's always a, a division or a discussion about taxes. In other words, should it go in the general fund? or should taxes be a dedicated fund for a certain environmental thing. We did do a billion dollar environmental bond act a, a, year, a few years ago when we're in the middle of other environmental things, but we're certainly open to it. A lot of people are open to it. Unfortunately, last year the PETA tax fell off the ground. I don't really know what, none of us really know quite what happened there, whether the industry made a case it was counterproductive, I don't know, that's what they said. But you know, I vote for all that stuff and you know, I'm comfortable doing it and yes, 
we just, some of us just came off a, a, another examination of Newtown Creek. We have issues locally, Superfund issues and other things. So we have to keep plugging away on all of that, no question about it. I want to, Eddie Cadiz, I think just left, but Eddie and Sharon are here and go back. They've been two people very active on environmental issues. Eddie works on our staff. So, you know, we're definitely out there and feel free to write us. I know you've been in Albany talking and advocating for some stuff and, you know, that's definitely moving forward. Newtown Creek is better than it was right, but it's still very polluted. Some of that is there's a, um, a agreement with ExxonMobil and the polluters to put money in. That might be another approach, but I certainly would vote for a tax uh, on super, <laughs> really a tax on, on almost anyone to help the environment. We all gonna have to pay more, but certainly people who are making big, big bucks, the system has to be fair and they have to pay their fair share. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, in short, I would say definitely yes. I mean, I've, I've actually proposed a millionaire's tax uh, related to MTA funding myself uh, that we couldn't get past this year, unfortunately, but we'll keep trying. But I would support a wealth tax, the Peter Tier tax, whatever. We have some incredibly wealthy people in New York, the wealthiest on earth. And they are getting off scot-free because they use the tax code to avoid tax liability. The rest of us are paying our fair share, and we've got to put an end to that. And so. Um, the short answer is yes, because the things we want to do, whether it's the MTA or school aid or health care or any of the things we want to tackle, are going to cost money. And people should be willing to dip into their pockets and, and help out. Now, there's, there's this group, which I enjoy talking about. They're called the Patriotic Millionaires, who are actually millionaires who want to be taxed more. And they've been running around talking about uh, the fact that they think that would be fair for all of their fellow millionaires to to do that as well. So hopefully we'll make some progress on it. The governor is not helpful in this regard. He is against um, taxing wealthy people. He can explain for himself why he feels that way, but I do not agree. Uh, five, eight, four. All right, uh, one of the question is, uh, as you elected officials, you know, uh, you're there to uh, help the community and your constituents. What happens when that voice of the constituents is not heard? And uh, I'm basically, I'm going to be able to bring that to uh, what's happening in our corridors of Corridor Avenue and Spiman Avenue. I have seen how many uh, ambulances and uh, uh, police, you know, police uh, not being able to do their job. So my question is, like, why has the community having been here and when is going to be a good time to do something about it? Thank you. As an elected official, it's an important question because we want to listen, but we also want to lead. And I want to ask a question. How many people here uh, support Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez's Green New Deal? Do you believe in the Green New Deal? And, and do you believe that climate change, right, is the crisis, an existential threat in our world? Uh, how many of you believe that? And, and I believe that if you believe that, uh, then we also have to understand that one of the major polluters, uh, one of the major sources of carbon emissions is, of course, uh, cars and automobiles. So uh, I believe that uh, bike lanes uh, can and do uh, make our world safer. I do believe that they make the environment uh, cleaner and our world more sustainable. I understand that there are people in this room uh, who uh, take exception uh, to the bike lanes on 43rd and Skillman, but I believe as a human being uh, that that is the way we should be building cities and moving forward in the future, uh, and, and that is my core belief, and I will always stand by that value. Thank you. Five, nine, four. Ah. Uh, hi folks, um, to follow up the concept of the last question, uh, what are we doing uh, to manage uh, major new construction in LIC in the district and specifically the uh, Animal Basin site um, where HQ2 was supposed to be? Of course, is what's happening currently? Is that like, yes. okay. And I think Jimmy could probably speak to this a little more too. I know that the, um, the, some of the landowners in the city have been in discussions about coming up with a plan moving forward. 
Um, my position has always been consistent. If someone's sitting around the table, come up with a plan, we better be represented at that table. Um, and Jimmy can speak to uh, the involvement of, uh, of the city council in that process currently, but I think it's just kicking off. Uh, but whether it's HQ2 or what's left of Animal Basin or Sunnyside Yards, my position is consistent. You want to sit down and come to a group like this and discuss what we need as part of any development? I'm all for that conversation. But I'm not going to be for something that just gets dropped on us by people who are already wealthy and trying to make more money off of uh, stressing our community. But Jimmy, do you want to? Sure. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, number one. Uh, we're only faced with this question uh, because a lot of folks uh, rose up uh, and opposed the really bad deal that Andrew Cuomo made with Jeff Bezos to build Amazon HQ2 on that site in the first place. Uh, and we learned, and we learned a lot of lessons from that experience, right, which is when uh, uh, rich people conspire with the governor to tell us what is going to be the future of our neighborhoods, that if we fight back and rise up, uh, we can defeat those forces. Uh, so now some folks are saying, what do we do once again uh, with that land? Do we do anything with that land? And what I have said to all of those folks, because EDC and city planning and all those folks are involved again, is uh, I'm not going to entertain anything unless it's a community-driven process, uh, unless the community is driving that. Uh, and the community's concerns are at the forefront before there's even a real plan to propose and potentially go through Euler, right? The, one of the many problems uh, with Amazon HQ2 is that it was gonna bypass the, the traditional land use review process, right? Which would have community board involvement and have many, many town halls and meetings and all those things. Uh, this process, if we even get to that process, would mandate that the community board was involved, all of these community meetings would take place, all of the input that wasn't there in HQ2 would be here. Having said that, I'm still not sold on anybody being able to produce a plan that gives us the sustainability and the green space, uh, uh, the schools, uh, all of the uh, community needs being met uh, uh, while, while sacrificing right, uh, affordability. And, and so uh, it's, it's a long road to hoe to even imagining that something uh, could meet the community's uh, uh, requirements, but if they think they have a plan that could, they should talk about it. They should come to the community. They should address the community board. They should address all the various stakeholders down there, including Queensbridge and Ravenswood, uh, all of the various civic associations. Uh, that's democracy, right? And that's got to happen before they have a plan set in motion about what they'd really like to see happen. So uh, I'm not sure anything's gonna happen. Uh, there are those early discussions. They are now starting to do some reach out. Um, uh, I wouldn't say that their first uh, outreaches have been uh, necessarily the most strategic or successful, but, uh, but they're doing it. And, and uh, I think the lessons learned from, from HQ2 have gotta be for, at the forefront of any discussion about what happens going forward. Would you like me to address it? Yes. Well, you know, I'd be happy. I know that you were very involved, obviously, in the anti-Amazon and had a Twitter feed and other things. Happy to address it. And I don't think it's any secret that I have a different view than my colleagues. We initially all signed the letter. 70 elected officials in this city signed that letter. Um, and when I went on the letter, it was very serious to me. I consulted with a lot of people in the community, a lot of community board people. Uh, should we take that step? I have no particular love for Amazon, but I want to talk a little bit about Euler versus a general project plan. And this is not a criticism of my dear friend Jimmy Van Bramer, but Euler is not the be all and end all in zoning. So from my point of view, a general project plan offered opportunities for the community to impact that project in a different way. I also want to say I've had many disagreements with Governor Cuomo on education funding, but again, to disagree slightly with Mike, you, the governor and the mayor are bigger pieces on the chessboard than the three of us. Whether we like that or not, I'd like to feel, gee, I'm really important, but the reality is the mayor and the governor are more important. They are city and statewide officials. It gives them an added clout to negotiate and fight with these big 
company. So again, I did not personally have a problem. We created an almost 50 person advisory board for that project, which I think could have brought real benefits to Queensbridge, Ravenswood, and the rest of the community. I also felt, and still feel, that there has been too much residential construction along the waterfront. That is not the original vision. The original vision was to have, was to have jobs and offices and even try to retain uh, industry, which many of you, well, some of you may know, I, was the, I am, was the sponsor, am the sponsor of the industrial business zones, which created uh, opportunities to keep industry, however difficult that is. So I felt that it would have uh, had reverse commuting, that people would have been coming into Long Island City to work in Long Island City. And those were my views that I had made no secret of and shared with many people in the community. Um, I now think we're in the worst of all possible worlds. You know, I had called at one point for a moratorium on construction in Long Island City because I was so disappointed. And, and I want to say, I had obviously on Twitter, you know, people love to be anonymous on Twitter. I, I don't tweet, I find it very disturbing. I think it's a rage machine. But I'm candid no matter where I am. It's one reason my team said don't have a tweet. But, but um, <laughs> because people know I'm blunt spoken. But I felt, and again, no, uh, criticism of Jimmy, who does a wonderful job, as Mike does, uh, to try to push forward, though we disagreed, obviously, in this instance, not initially, but later on. Um, I felt those ramps, the green space under the ramps, for that project to go up so high was ice in winter. I, didn't, I just didn't feel it was worth that much. So I participated in an effort to call for a moratorium. Now, did I ever really think there'd be a moratorium? But part of what you have to do when you're in elected office is push, 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 to try to push back. I did not see it and don't see that as inconsistent with trying to grapple with the reality of the Annabelle Basin site. Right now, it doesn't, it's, it's, a, it's not a great site. And it creates a, a, a barrier between Queensbridge and the NYCHA developments and the kind of the Golden Coasty kind of tower thing that's been built there. So again, I felt it could have worked. Obviously, other people did not feel that. I do want to put out there, if any of you saw the Wall Street Journal on Friday, Walmart and uh, Oracle apparently funded a lot of the anti amazon stuff. And uh, I went back and looked at this fake Twitter feed called Free and Fair Markets, and sure enough, some of the people who picketed my office were some of the people that were part of this fake AstroTurf Walmart-funded operation, which I kind of felt at the time because I didn't recognize any of them. So I would just caution everyone in the world that we're living, it seems like people can kind of reinvent themselves and turn into something that's not real, right? Why would, Walmart's certainly not better than Amazon in my view. It's a company we've all spent a great deal of trying, trying to push back on. The fact that 32BJ and the building trades had an agreement to have union workers in this big non-union company, which would have been the first time that they accepted unionization to me, made the Amazon project an acceptable project. I'm not criticizing anybody that was opposed to it. I respect my colleagues. But I also make it, want to make it very clear, because some people here obviously will disagree. I accept my choices. So I was at a meeting recently where if someone says they can't vote for me because I felt this project was workable, that's your choice. That's what we do here. We put ourselves out there. But I want to make it clear to people that anyone who's telling you it was all bad, and now the same developers are going to put housing there, that's all good, that's, I think, uh, unrealistic. I think that, um, and, and a little disingenuous too, I think that the site is there, there's pressure to develop it. I think it could have been something that worked. I hope that it will be something that works, but we're gonna have to see going forward, just like with Sunnyside Yards. Some of this is out of our control. We are local elected officials. You are local people here. We're all together, working together. And yes, we can have an impact, but I think we have to be honest with each other that there are gonna to continue to be these pressures and how we handle them is gonna be the next phase. It's over, it's done with, it, it pulled back, it pulled out, whatever happened. I still think we lost a chance to have a lot of high tech tech jobs. I know, Anatole, you probably disagree. You work at LinkedIn, you're a tech guy. I'm not a tech person, all right? I have to be honest. I'm a Luddite. I'm not a big tech person. So maybe I was wrong about the tech jobs. I didn't understand. Maybe you can enlighten me. But I certainly felt it would have been an asset for the community if it was done right. And having a general project plan it, to me, was a way to achieve that. I don't believe that ULERP is you know, the be all and end all. I'm not saying it's a bad process, but it's certainly not, in my view, has also produced many things that weren't great throughout the city. And no, again, all, it's a council process, and it has strengths, 
but it ha like any process, it has weaknesses. And this project would have had strengths and weaknesses going forward. So that's my view. Obviously, it's not everyone's view, but I'm not going to pretend otherwise. You know, I tell it the way I see it. I I'm disappointed that it didn't happen. I think it could have been good. And I do worry that what's going to replace it may actually be not as, um, we had a chance to have jobs there. I, I, I think we're going to end up with just more housing. And then we become what I had a big fight with Dan Doktoroff about once, a dormitory community. I hated that. People in the Bloomberg administration used to talk about Long Island City as a dormitory community. The idea being that after you're there a few years, you leave. You don't send your children to city schools. You don't stay in the city. That's wrong. We don't want that. We want, we want a better community and a full community. So that's my view, and I'm happy to discuss it further. Thank it's you. Give the assemblywoman uh, mentioned a few things. I just want to uh, uh, clear up a couple of things. Um, one, uh, uh, I agree that if the plan to replace uh, HQ2 uh, involves uh, all luxury housing, it's dead on arrival, right? It's just never happening. That can never happen. That should never happen. Um, but I, I want to say, uh, uh, and again, I have respect even when we disagree uh, for my colleague, and we can all agree uh, to disagree respectfully here, right? We can agree to disagree respectfully, but I do just wanna say, because you pointed out uh, the labor agreements with 32BJ and the building trades on HQ2, um, look, Amazon now has about 700,000 employees, 700,000 employees, and that number is only going up because they are growing exponentially. Uh, I asked Amazon if they would allow even one of their direct employees to unionize, to organize, and they said no, that never, they will never allow one of their direct employees, 32BJ in the building trades were going to be contractors, right? Not Amazon employees, not working for Jeff Bezos. They told me never, they will never allow one of their employees who work for Amazon, who get an Amazon paycheck, to be able to organize, to fight for themselves uh, to be in a union. That is unacceptable. That, to me, was a deal breaker from the beginning. And, and if, we, if we tie all of this together, income inequality, right? and, and, and uh, criminal justice reform, all the things that are wrong, right? And you say that part of it is because employees aren't getting paid what they really should be paid. And how do organizers uh, organize and how do workers get power? It's by joining a labor union, right? It's getting that collective power to be able to fight for better wages. So if the problem is income inequality and wages remaining stagnant, for people at the lowest levels, but incredibly high for Jeff Bezos is worth $160 billion, then we have to push for more unionization and we have to push companies like Amazon to break their anti-union stance. Because if Amazon grows to a million, right, uh, uh, employees, a million and a half employees, they're just growing. But said none of their employees could ever organize and ever be in a union, we're only shooting ourselves in the foot and hurting workers long term. But I, I, just, I, just, I, I just want to respond, though. I don't know any employer that usually says welcome to the union. Amazon is now in a right-to-work state in Virginia. So we're not going to succeed in unionizing people in Virginia. We had a chance in New York. I know I supported Stuart Applebaum and the retail workers who we work closely with on our farm worker bill. It took us 20 years to get those things, collective bargaining rights. If, if, we, if they had been in New York, I believe that Stewart, who thought he was close to an agreement to unionize those warehouses on Staten Island and other parts of the city, we could have had that. Now, of course, we do not. So it, again, it, it's very difficult, and I understand people can come down on both sides. But there were two unions that had agreements and a third that was working towards it. I guess I would ask the question, in a right-to-work state like Virginia, how many new agreements do you think those workers are going to have? 
So the jobs went to Virginia, and the unions aren't going to be there. So it's only in New York that we could have pushed forward with an action to get the retail workers a contract. So you know, yes, of course, at a hearing, I was appalled at what they said, and I thought Jimmy's question was great, and they deserve to be booed and grilled. But the reality is most employers, large employers, anybody who knows our history, they don't usually say, oh, welcome. You know, My father struck for seven months against the phone company many years ago. The phone company didn't just say, oh, yeah, we'd love to sign that contract. It took union action to get that. But those things are not going to happen in a right-to-work state like Virginia. They could have happened in New York, and I believe that they would have happened. So, you know, it's a very difficult call. I understand some of you how you feel, but I'm also very honest about my own views, having worked in this field for a long time, and what I think could have happened if we had stuck together and forced them to accept some concessions. And now, with a new project, we'll never know. The new project may not be building trades, may not be 32 BJ. So who needs that? So it, it doesn't get us anywhere. So that's my view. So just to respond to that. But yes, Jimmy's question was good, and their answer was appalling, no question about it. I was wondering when this was going to come up today. Um, so a couple of things uh, to add my uh, thoughts on this. Uh, first of all, any suggestion that the opposition was AstroTurf is completely untrue. The, I was, I was at these rallies, I met with people. I'll send you the article. This, this, this was overwhelmingly a community-based opposition. I, I know the people personally, and that's, yeah. that's just the reality of it. For anyone that lives in this community, they, they saw it, and I'm, and I'm sure you saw it as well. I'll send you the Yes, I'm sure you saw it as well. They paid for that Twitter feed. Um, now, as it relates to um, the Amazon situation and what happens now and what do they do, and, there was an NYU economist since February 14th, which was the day they left, looked at how many new jobs Amazon has added in New York City. 1,500 jobs they have added since February 14th, okay? They had promised 25,000 over 10, 15 years, whatever it was in that agreement. You extrapolate out 1,500 over that same time period, or 1,500 six months over that same time period, it is in excess of what they were promising without all the subsidies that, that were going with it. So there was a lot of talk, and a lot of people on the right were making fun of someone who said we could save that $3 billion. But let me tell you something. If the jobs come anyway, and the jobs come without the subsidy, then the economic activity is coming anyway, and we will, in fact, have saved $3 billion that we can spend on other things. That is just the mathematical truth of the situation. Amazon was always going to be in New York, and they always will be in New York, because this is where the skilled workforce is. Google is adding 20,000 jobs in New York as we speak, and Amazon cannot sacrifice those workers to their competition. That is why the fix was in for New York from the first moment they decided to put on this fake contest for the whole country. Uh, there were people who were smarter than I am when this started that said, watch this, they're going to end up in Washington and New York, as everyone was around the country was bending over themselves bidding on it. Now, as for what happens on that location and whether it's going to be residential or uh, jobs, etc., the first wave of Amazon workers was going to be in the city building. The city Corp, city, whatever they call themselves these days. Um, so they were clearing out tenants, making room for Amazon to occupy the whole building. Within a matter of weeks, Am uh, when Amazon said they were leaving, 80% of that building was filled with new tenants. Business tenants, new jobs, Centene is coming there, which is a, a health insurance company, Altice, which is former Spectrum, the cable company is going to be in there. So there will be jobs in Long Island City. Long Island City will be just fine. We will continue to represent the community, all three of us, to the best of our ability and uh, the way we think is best for everyone. I am certainly never going to lay down and, and let anyone dictate to us what's going to happen to us. I certainly am never going to let Andrew Cuomo tell us what's going to happen in our neighborhoods. You can, you can bet on that. Uh, I don't care if he has more chips on the table or whatever. I am not comfortable with him dictating to my communities what's going to happen here. Uh, I think I made that clear uh, with my actions as well as my words. So uh, we're all doing the best we can, and I think we live in the best part of New York City, and we're all fighting in our own way to keep it that way. 620. Hi, good afternoon. Thanks for being here. Um, for affordable housing and homelessness, can you help to pass, I believe it's Hennessy Home Stability Support Act and eliminate MCIs? Uh, yes. Yes. Um, 
That, that bill, Andy Hevesy's Home Stability Act bill, is a good bill. It should have been passed. It's very unfortunate that uh, the Bloomberg uh, plan that was in place was discontinued about six or seven years ago. That would be a way to bring it back, and I would be happy to see that. I don't know completely about how I would feel about completely eliminating MCIs. I think they have to have a, uh, a, a turnover. But you know, you want landlords to continue to invest in buildings too. So there might be a way to do that differently so that people don't get socked with the cost of the MCI. It's pretty clear that a lot of people abuse that as well. You have to just read about uh, landlords who you know, did fake improvements and things like that. But in terms of the home stability, absolutely. And I think, I, I think I'm a co-sponsor, I don't know, in the Senate. But um, you know, we, we were all supporting Andrew in that effort. And we liked your Mets uh, journal. <laughs> That's Cheers. the heavy yeah. seat, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, Regina, I thought you were going to ask me about puppy mills and cat declawing when you got up. Regina loves animals, as do I. We did ban cat declawing in the state, by the way, first in the nation. And, uh, and we're working on banning puppy mills as well, but that's uh, not the subject she was asking about. Yes, as you know, I carried the eliminated MCI bill, uh, and we actually made great progress on it. Uh, we didn't get all the way there, but we did a lot more than the landlords would have liked. They're furious about it, as it is, um, but I'm committed with Nilda and her group and uh, Woodside on the Move to continue fighting to finish the job on it. Mike, can I just say something? Uh, while it's a, a state uh, question that you asked for, certainly support the Hevesy Bill, and I do believe we should eliminate MCIs altogether, absolutely. 628. Uh, hey, my name is Rick Doro. I run the Sunnyside United Dog Society. Um, I'm in Lodati Park the last 17 years probably as much as anyone. Uh, one of the things that was really effective when we were first hanging out in the park was that we had um, cops on patrol on the foot. They would come into the park late at night, make a presence known. We've had a recent uptick in Lodati and vandalism. Can you guys get the 108 to uh, get more people to hit the hot spots like Lodati Park at night? I've been working with the um, Parks Department police. They're coming in at night, but the 108 seems to not really care as much. So what can we do to get the police department to hit the hot spots in yeah. Sunnyside like Lodati that, Park? Yeah. yeah, that's the kind of thing we can, we'll stay and as individual complaints, we can do a letter, we can do a follow-up call. I think that's something we can all work on together. Yes, I, yeah, first of all, I just want to say thank you. Uh, Rick is one of the amazing people in our community who does great work uh, with the Suds Dog Run. Uh, and, <laughs> And, and I also just want to say I believe communities are safer when they have more dog runs. Um, and we have more, more places uh, for folks to bring their dogs. Uh, I just want to say, number one, I'm glad to hear you say that you think the parks uh, patrol uh, is actually uh, visible uh, because we at the council put millions of dollars into having more parks patrol officers. Uh, and in terms of the 108th precinct um, being more visible, I mean, you know, it's, it's frustrating to hear that you don't feel that that's the situation because we have the NCO command and NCO officers, that is actually what they're supposed to be doing. So uh, I'm happy to talk to uh, uh, Captain Gibbs and, and see uh, where those folks uh, are and, and if they can be more visible. You could drive through the park and walk there at night and no one do that. Right. I'll definitely be in touch with Captain Gibbs. We have time for two more questions. 642. Hi, um, you've mentioned what you don't want, uh, that you don't like the DC's plans for Sunnyside Yards. What do you actually foresee or what would you like to see there and who would fund it? Yeah. Um, that's a very good question. I mentioned earlier, I always start with the infrastructure needs of this rapidly growing community. So then your question is how to fund it, which is a separate one, but as a starting point for me, it's open space, school space, mass transit investment, hospitals, okay? So we have to figure out how all that becomes integrated into whatever plan is discussed, uh, because I don't think this community can take the stress of additional burden on any of those pieces of infrastructure. It's already a problem. It is already a problem throughout Western Queens where kids can't go to their local schools because they're full and they end up getting uh, sent far from home and, and so on and so on. The problems are familiar with everyone. Sewage, I didn't even mention, which is a problem in parts of Long Island City as well. Um, so then the question is how do you fund it? Well, that's when 
either government has to decide to make investments in these things, which goes back to Danielle's question about where you're gonna get the money to do that. I think that's a big part of the solution. We should be starting to look at public spaces as public spaces, uh, which the public should be driving the conversation about how to develop and use. Too often now, the, the second question you ask is the first one government asks, which how are we gonna pay for something to happen there? And of course, the people with the money show up and say, here's how I'll pay it if you let me make a whole bunch of money by building a 50-story skyscraper and making money off of it. I think we've got it all backwards. Um, and so we have to start thinking as a public entity, being the government, working in the interest of the public, not in the interest of the private sector first. Um, what, would, what would you like to see? I think that's the question for a group like this. We need to get people's feedback to see if there is some type of uh, some type of development they'd support. At this point, I don't see any support for anything. I think that yards are an important uh, kind of uh, lung for the area. You know, it's open space. You know, I don't really feel it. I mean, and I would say, you know, many of you know I've worked on education issues for a long time now and have just recently given up the committee. But I, I mean, I've spent really a lifetime getting school seats in this district and, and helping to put millions and millions of dollars into school seats and we're still over, very overcrowded. So, I, you know, the idea of now absorbing many more thousands of people is a challenge and unless there are real partnerships and real efforts to put schools in, you know, I, I, I think it's almost unworkable. Um, so, you know, I would be curious, the person who asked the question of what, what you would want to see, if you have some thoughts. Would you like to respond or she's in the back now, yeah. To share that, yeah, let me just, you know, if, if there's, is there, well, there, there was there something at Aviation High School, and I know there's going to be something at CUNY Law School. You need to look. The agency running this is, is the New York City's Economic Development Corporation, which is an arm of the mayor, and I guess the, does the city council fund it too? I guess, but it's mostly an arm of the mayor. So you need to be at those meetings. Um, we have sent staff. Uh, Mike is correct. We, we, you know, they sort of put our names on it, but they haven't exactly shared a lot so with us. Was right. Um, so so go. Yeah. Did you find it helpful or not? I'm sorry. We did actually find it, did actually find it interesting right. and helpful, okay. but again, everything they're coming up with is being shut down. So do we have an other way outside of the mayor that we can have our voice heard on a platform to share what we might like to see? Perhaps we could. Um, perhaps uh, during the legislative session is coming soon, so be a little hard, but maybe as we roll forward, like I have a little state fair coming up, you know, there might be some other opportunities to have EDC come in and talk to people. And I appreciate very much your thoughts. Thank you. Uh, and I just want to add, uh, I've not been uh, really excited about the EDC process and, and how those meetings have been uh, uh, going. Um, uh, look, I, I understand that uh, there are some people, I don't think a, a majority, uh, but there are some people who want to see something happen there and are looking for ways to make something happen there. Uh, it seems to me like uh, uh, open space, uh, uh, schools, uh, uh, the Assemblywoman mentioned the, the transit hub or the, the, the station uh, are things that uh, are desirable, but uh, the uh, offset, if you will, uh, is, is probably not a, a, a value add proposition for the community at the end of the day, uh, because what we'd have to give up in order to get the few things that we wanted is probably uh, far too costly in terms of the long-term future of these neighborhoods, uh, because it would drastically and radically change, right, Sunnyside and Woodside to the south and Astoria uh, uh, to the north. Uh, and that's sort of where I grew up, and, and uh, that very working class part of Astoria. Um, and uh, uh, what, what they're contemplating there there's no doubt in my mind, just like HQ2 would have radically changed the face of Western Queens, so too would what they're proposing there for Sunnyside Yard. Uh, we got one more, 602. Okay. The rich developers are getting subsidies to build their empire. So why doesn't the representative make a bill to eliminate corporate welfare from the rich developers and have them use their own resources so that they can stop mooching from the government and the middle class people. There, 
There is a bill that I sponsor with um, Senator Salazar in Brooklyn and Ron Kim, I think, in the Assembly, um, that would um, allow New York to enter into agreements with other states to mutually pull back on these contests, these subsidy contests, which serve no one but the already wealthy. In Europe, a lot of those subsidy contests are already prohibited in the European Union because they figured out that it's really stupid to just be throwing public money at entities that don't need it because you're paying them to come to one state instead of another state. So there is a bill, uh, I'm a sponsor of it, to try and uh, eliminate New York's participation in those kind of things. Yeah. We, over the years, you know, I, I was actually opposed to the construction of the Citibank building. I thought there were too many subsidies back then. We didn't win that fight. The building got built. I have voted against some of these uh, programs when they came online. They were all part of a different era in New York to get people to invest in the city during the 70s and 80s. Some of them are renewed, some of them are permanent. One of the problems with some of these tax breaks is under Governor Pataki and the Republican Senate, some of these things were negotiated as part of the budget and became permanent, so it's harder to end them. Some of them are um, extensions, they're sunsetted, and I have often voted no. The hard reality is even voting no, some of them still keep passing. So how do we then change that system so that people don't get ridiculous subsidies? I mean, we're facing now in our own, this is my assembly district in our own neighborhood, buildings that got 20-year tax breaks and now the tax breaks are ending and people are getting hit. Regular average people in Long Island City are getting hit with gigantic increases. And we've been involved in trying to support uh, some kind of a different setup that will not hurt people. So all these programs are problematic and they need to be reviewed. Now that we have a Democratic Senate, you heard Mike, it's my hope that some of these programs will be reviewed fairly and ended, modified, capped, something. Obviously, again, we want to continue to encourage people to invest in New York City, but there has to be a way to do it in as fair a way as possible. And hopefully with the Democratic Senate, some of that will start. And uh, I know we're wrapping up, but before we do, I just want to say, like uh, Senator Gianaris, I also introduced several pieces of legislation in the city council uh, to eliminate these subsidies as well. And now we have to get, again, that political will from leadership uh, to make sure we actually accomplish that. All right. Well, I've been told that we've got to cut it off. So thank you very much, guys. And I think some people will stick around.